Okay, it's all greased and oiled. Let me see what the spark plug looks like. Well, she's a little dirty, but that gap actually looks to be quite large, doesn't it? Let me try to measure that. Before I tell you, what, what do you think that gap is? I've got it back to about 28 thousandths. And we'll just verify that it still works. I just bought a new compression tester the other day. So as long as I got the spark plug out, I think I'll uh, give it a try. I've got a half inch uh, pipe thread adapter that fits with the 14 millimeter. I've never checked the compression before on this little engine, so I really don't know what to expect, but I do have a guess. I'm going to guess about 50 PSI, so I'm going to test it now cold and see what kind of a reading we get, and then I'm going to test it again after it warms up just for fun to see if it changes at all. So here's zero and that's 50 and it looks like it's a little bit more than halfway. So, so we're going to call that 30 for now. And then again, I'll test it again after it uh, gets to operating temperature just to see if it changes. Let's see what the fuel looks like. This is a little gas tank right here. Well, it's got a bit of a green tint to it. I'm not sure why that is. This is not ethanol fuel. This came out of the tank as well. Some sort of fibrous material. I don't know what that could possibly be. I better drain the whole tank now just to be safe. Well, I've got the tank drained and flushed and it's hard to see down in there, but uh, it looks good. All right, so I'm gonna get that filled up with some fresh non-ethanol fuel and uh, we'll fire it up. If you don't know how hit and miss engines work, here's just a quick rundown on the anatomy of it. This is basically the carburetor. It's nothing more than a mixer though. Uh, down is in the run position, all the way horizontal to the right is in the full choke position. This is the uh, intake valve. It's on a very light spring and you can see that there's no arm or anything to actuate it. The intake valve works on uh, vacuum alone. So when the piston comes down, pulls the intake valve open and allows fuel into the combustion chamber. So this, of course, is the exhaust valve, and this is actuated by the mechanism that controls the speed of the engine. So when it's time for the engine to fire, the, the arm will allow the exhaust valve to close all the way and create compression. So until it's time for the engine to fire, it keeps the exhaust valve open, so it allows the engine to free spin and the flywheels provide kinetic energy. This oiler right here is the only thing that provides oil to the cylinder. 
I'll show you when the engine is running, but I meter the drips of oil to approximately one drip every 20 seconds, give or take. And that's plenty to keep it lubricated. So this is the connecting rod right here. And down in there is the interior of the piston. So this is what they call a total loss oil system. You add oil via the oiler, goes into the cylinder, the engine uses what it needs and it just pushes out the rest onto the ground or onto the plate, whatever you have right down in here. This engine does not have a throttle. It is uh, governed by speed. This lever right there is the speed control. There's, I think, four different positions. You set it to whatever speed you want and walk away from it. Most hit and miss engines that you see actually have open spoked flywheels. These are actually pretty unique, oftentimes referred to as dishpan flywheels. And these are in fact original for 1923 Fairbanks Morse. This engine does not have its own magneto, unfortunately. So I run it off of a battery. Here's the ignition coil. And we'll pull out the wire for the battery here. This particular ignition coil is a six screw uh, metal top Model T ignition coil made from approximately late 1913 to 1915 only, just those two years. The ignition coils like this don't really care what type of battery you use to power them. You could run a six volt, uh, eight volt, nine volt, 12 volt, I even ran mine off of a 20 volt uh, cordless drill battery a couple times. I do have a handle for this that fits on back flywheel here and you sort of lock it down. But I prefer not to use them. I prefer just to crank it over by hand. So I'm not going to worry about the oiler until I get it fired up. I'll just close that for now. So to start, I'm going to leave the coil switch disengaged because I don't want it to fire just yet. And I'm going to put the speed control lever in the lowest spot because I want compression. I just want to turn over a couple times with the choke all the way on to draw some fuel up. Go through a couple rotations. So now I'm going to turn the coil switch on so we get power. I'm going to turn it to half choke and see if it'll fire. Full choke. Well, it's not picking up fuel from the tank, so I got the gas tank removed. I want to remove this little uh, pickup tube. It's got a screen on the bottom and it's got a check ball in there. It looks like the ball might be jammed. There. Yeah, it was jammed. Don't want to lose that guy. I'm gonna go blow some air through this and put it back together. She's clear now.
The only thing that makes sense to me is maybe I accidentally put some ethanol fuel in this in the past and it's been sitting for a long time. I don't know what else would have caused that green tint and this ball to stick like that. So now let's do that final compression test and we'll wrap this up. All right, our cold compression test, if you remember, was about 30. So I guess I'll call that 35 or 40. Not that it matters, I was just curious. And I am cautiously optimistic about my new compression tester uh, you know it's just an Amazon special I think it was a $45 or something I've used it maybe four or five times so far and uh, it seems to be a decent unit fingers crossed all right we'll try a warm start here and then we'll sign off <laughs> 